In the recent seminar series, Demystifying Boardroom Dynamics, Ms. Pooja Shukla, Senior Lecturer in the Li Shao Key School of Business and Administration at the Open University of Hong Kong, talks about dysfunctional boards. Ms. Shukla explains the role of the board of directors and then discusses why boards dysfunction and how to build an effective board. Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are going to discuss dysfunctional boards. In other words, bad boards. So before we begin, what do you think is the role of board of directors in a company? You might think they are the rich looking people, they are the engines of the train called company. Yes, the role of board of directors is to provide guidance and direction to the company. They set the goals for the company and they monitor the progress. And this way, the importance of board of directors is very crucial because they have to, at all the times, act in the interests of the shareholders and the stakeholders. If you are a corporate governance student, you would know that in terms of corporate governance code, we have a lot of guidelines as to how board of directors would act. But in this seminar, we are not going to make it very, very technical and we are going to discuss organically how teamwork, if is good, can bring great results and if bad, it can lead to the downfall of a company. I'm sure most of you know what happened with BlackBerry. I still remember when I started my career, BlackBerry used to be a big thing and I gifted myself a BlackBerry and I used to show it off sending emails on my BlackBerry. And I kept thinking, when would be the next model of BlackBerry be out? I was always looking forward to that. And look, now, who knows about BlackBerry? Maybe you use it as a doorstopper. What happened to Yahoo? It used to be a big thing. What happened to HP? So we are going to discuss how bad board of directors are going to lead a company in such a direction that it affects the profitability in long term and it leads to the brand downfall. So let us begin. So today we are going to cover role of board of directors as I exactly defined. We are going to cover how to diagnose if your board is dysfunctional. We are going to discuss why do boards dysfunction how to build an effective board and how boring meetings create environments where back channel politics thrive and ignore the important discussions that are critical to board success. So if you are watching the performance of board, what are the red flags that can lead you to think maybe my board is dysfunctional or maybe a few directors are dysfunctional and it can eventually lead the whole board as a team to dysfunction. So let's see what are the red flags. If your directors are missing deadlines, if your directors are having low attendance at the board meetings, like I said, board meetings is a type of teamwork and all the directors have to work together. If you have any background of corporate governance, you would know that in uh, most of the annual reports, you have to tell which director had what kind of attendance rate uh, in the board meetings or so. We are also going to see if directors cover their weaknesses from one another, which means they would never be able to overcome that and improve. If your directors hesitate to provide a constructive feedback, not just to the other directors, but also to the important decisions that you are going to undertake in the board meeting. If the directors are focusing their time and energy only on the politics and not on the important issues 
that would simply mean that the board is not going to function so smoothly. If the personal or political agendas thrive in the boardroom and the important discussions take a back seat, it's another red flag. Lack of confidence in the board, and which happens a lot when board of directors are revisiting the same discussions over and over again without adding fruitfully anything to the matter. And finally, if because of the board, the chairman has to kind of discipline them and eventually this puts an undue burden on the chairman. Now let us address the elephant in the room. Like we discussed that the board of directors are crucial in all the decision making of the company. But you might question, okay, what happened to the big companies if all the directors were so educated, if they had great backgrounds, they were so experienced, what went wrong? How did big companies fall? How on earth they took such decisions that the media cannot stop talking about? Let us discuss. You might question, why didn't the board of Tesla intervene when its CEO Elon Musk was tweeting about its overvalued stock price? Was the board of Volkswagen not aware of the company cheating on emission testing? You might know the big case of Volkswagen where they were cheating on the emissions and finally they had to pay penalties running into billions of dollars and customer complaints and finally the brand took a hit. You might also question, did the board of Boeing approve the manufacture of 737 MAX? If you do not know the story, I encourage you to go back and read more about it. Was the board of Wells Fargo attending regular board meetings when the bank was creating millions of false accounts on behalf of its customers without their consent? You might argue that were the board of directors just sitting, marking on their attendance sheets and not performing? You might also question, where were the boards of Samsung Galaxy note when it was launched in the market and the customers saw the phones burning. So all of these examples make you question that if eventually the company is going to do what it wants to do, what is the role of board of directors? That is why I'm going to tell you all the things that can go wrong and all the things that you can do to steer everything in the right direction so that the company as a product does not suffer. So what can go wrong if issues are left undetected? As I gave you um, the earlier examples, you can see that if these issues of board dysfunction are not uh, cured in time, they can lead to immense issues like financial risks. You know what happened with HP, you know what happened with Yahoo. Legal risks, we just discussed the example of Volkswagen reputational issues, we discussed Samsung, market risks. If you commit one fault in the market, your competitors are going to use that as an excuse to advertise their product and take away the market share that you spent years and years in building. So now let us discuss what does the research say about the board performance. In this research by Board Excellence, they found that only 10% of the boards are high performance boards, whereas 15% of the boards are considered strong boards. More than 35% boards were just average, and 25% mediocre, and 15% dysfunctional. So as you can see from this graph, not a lot of boards are functional and that is why we are going to learn how to make boards more functional and more effective, how to increase board effectiveness and eventually which would lead you to profitability and better performance. 
Now, before we pinpoint fingers at people and the teams, let us discuss why do boards dysfunction? What is the reason? Is that a genuine reason? Is that a made up reason? Is it because they are fake? Is it because they don't want to help? Is it because they are just not fit for the job? So let's discuss the reasons. The first group of factors is the individual factors. For example, if there are a lot of board directors who are there on the board just because they know the other directors. They are on the board because they might have worked in the same industry earlier. They might be on the board because they think that I'm so old and my other friend who is running this listed company trusts me. So a lot of these individual factors like old age, sickness, um, experience in the industry which is ever changing and the director is not able to keep up the pace with the new industry standards or the most common factors of all time. Most of the directors have taken up so many directorships that they are not able to devote enough time on one or performance of one. The second is the group factors. Sometimes two people are not able to work as a team. Um, let me give you a very interesting example. I was reading the science magazine a few days ago and I read that the ocean waves, there is no such thing as ocean waves. It is a combination of wind and water, right? So when wind and water in the perfect conditions, they come together, they form the waves. Similarly, this is how teamwork works. Two people, you put them together, they are going to create wonders. The same two people, maybe in some other conditions, are going to blow everything up. So group factors, along with individual factors, play a big role. The other issues could be the leadership issues. Sometimes your chairman is over-influencing. Sometimes your CEO could be under-influencing. Sometimes the board together are not able to provide the required leadership to the whole company as they should. The next is the business dynamics. As I cannot stop talking about the business dynamics, anything which was good one year ago might not even be valid right now because the businesses are continuously changing and they are bringing on newer and newer requirements of you to conduct the business in a better and more efficient way. And some directors or some teams cannot keep up the pace. And as a result, the board suffers because they are not able to renew themselves as quickly as they should. Now let us discuss the types of dysfunctional board. You would say that, oh, the board team can either be good or bad. But now I'm going to further dissect that point and discuss what are the types of bad boards. I'm going to bring up eight types of dysfunctional boards and I'm going to share a lot of funny stories with you. So let's begin. Before we begin, I want to show you how a typical board structure looks like. So we have the chair, we have a company secretary, and then we have the CEO, CFO. CLO is the chief legal officer and CTO is the chief technical officer if the company demands to have these. Then we have a few executive directors and executive directors, as you might know, are the inside people. They are the people who are the salaried employees of the company and they are the executive directors, whereas non-executive directors are the outsiders who are there on the board just because they have that kind of skill set or they are there to mentor and provide guidance to the board. Uh, we also have independent non-executive directors, which is I and E D. But just to clarify and keep it simple, I have um, prepared this as uh, non-executive directors. So this is how a balanced board looks like. And the other scenarios that we are going to cover would cover all these people and how they affect each other 
and resulting um, into the uh, company either going up or going down in terms of their uh, profitability. Type one is where the CEO is the ringmaster. I'm sure all of you know what a ringmaster is. In this case, the CEO is basically the decision maker. The CEO decides what goes in the company at what time and who does what. CEO is the person who generally is, in this case, uh, generally is responsible to appoint all other uh, executives and non-executive directors. And hence, CEO is over influential, so influential that the balance of the board becomes imbalanced. Imagine if you are working as a team and one person takes the charge of doing everything. What happens? You know, it becomes an imbalanced team. So this kind of board eventually uh, becomes dysfunctional because the other directors, executive and non-executive, are not given a chance to contribute to the decision making or whatever background they have, they have brought uh, themselves, the kind of skills they have brought with them are not put to use. So this is the first type. The second type is where the chairman is a dictator, which means the chairman is over influential. In very simple words, I will explain the role of a chairman in a company. The role of a chairman is to provide guidance to the board, to basically discipline and be the leader of the board. So it is the responsibility of the chair to make sure that there is a proper open forum of discussion and everyone gets a proper opportunity and enough time to talk. A lot of chairmen I have seen in my professional careers are where they are mostly the majority, um, I would say, the shareholders. And they have spent so much time in the company that they know the company so well. Or even if they are not the shareholders, they have that kind of um, influence in the company because of some other reasons that they think that they know the most. And instead of they proposing all the members to join and discuss the subjects um, like in a proper democratic governance uh, structure, they rather influence it with um, pushing their ideas and their insights on the board. And when you have this kind of chairman, as obvious it would sound like, the board is imbalanced and the other directors are not able to contribute enough as they should in normal board meetings. The third type of board is a stale board. So what is the meaning of stale? That simply does not mean something that stinks, something which is not fresh. So an unrefreshed board is a stale board. You might know that Whenever you are working as a board of director in a company, you need to refresh your skills. At the same time, the company needs to refresh its board too. For example, if you were a company producing uh, X type of product five years ago, you might have diversified or the market could have changed or the regulator would have imposed stricter regulations on you because the earlier set of board of directors that you had are now not able to provide that kind of direction that they were expected to. Or the board of directors, even if they want to, they do not have um, that kind of capability. So as a result, your board is stale. Your board has lost the power your board has lost, as we say, the fire in the belly. And your board eventually is not able to contribute or help your CEO and your other executive directors. And eventually, it's the company that suffers. 
The next type of board is a toothless board. Um, so when I say toothless, I mean that people are things without teeth, which means they cannot bite, which means they are underpowered. So when the board of directors are not empowered enough that their opinions and their advice is not absorbed by the board, which means you just keep talking, but it does not affect or it does not reflect in your decision making. So this kind of underpowered boards, since they do not contribute anything to the company or its decision making, or they do not provide any kind of guidance to the CEO, they are useless. The fifth type of board is the puppet of the family board. And I have to tell you unashamedly that this is the most common type of board. The puppet of the family means when it's a big family business. I'm not going to take the names of the family businesses, but as you would know that most of the family businesses in the whole world, whether it's Asia or Africa or uh, the West, everywhere, whenever it's a family board, they like to control the company. It's my money, so I decide what I do with my money. You are the director, you are getting paid your director fees, keep your mouth shut. This kind of attitude is very injurious to the health of a company. But as you would know, that when it comes to the family, it's mostly the family members, their sons and daughters and son-in-law and daughter-in-law controlling everything. And the kind of offsprings that they have, they follow what their ancestors were doing. The family members are acting more uh, towards their personal benefit, ignoring what the company needs of them. So um, as I would uh, believe that you all know um, what kind of family businesses I am talking about, and rather I would encourage you to make a list of such kind of family businesses and see um, how their performance has been, or rather argue with me in, in during the class that you think that it's the family board which runs better than a proper democratic governed board. The next type of board is a mini board within a board. This is probably the second most common type of board. As you would believe that there is a board and there is a mini board within that board. So just before the board meetings, they conduct um, phone calls or conference calls between themselves within those uh, few members of the board to decide, to pre-decide what they are going to talk about in the main board meeting. Which means in the actual board meeting, all the directors, executives and non-executives feel that a real board meeting is taking place. Whereas in reality, it's all fixed, just like you fix a game, a match. So the executives and non-executives feel very disempowered. And I think it's very disrespectful to such boards, such board of directors who are there on the board because of their experiences to mentor you. And this kind of attitude undermines their performance or their capabilities because you are not even giving them a chance to put forward their views. The next board type is the narcissistic executives versus unappreciative non-executives. Like I explained, executive directors are the inside people of the company. They are the salaried employees and non-executive directors are the outsiders who are hired, who are on the board because of their experiences. Non-executives generally are old people. They are generally people who have retired or nearing retirement age. To give you an example, um, I think the best, best example for this case is Japan. In Japanese companies, the executives 
resist appointing non-executive directors because they think that we run the company, we work in this company um, 365 days a year. How can someone who comes and visits only four times a year tell us how can that person contribute anything? So when your executives suffer from this kind of uh, feeling that the non-executives have nothing to contribute, this leads to another syndrome. It's called uh, DK effect. It means that uh, the overconfidence of people leads them to believe that they are so um, overperforming that they do not even realize how underperforming they are and hence they do not uh, give themselves a chance to improve or work towards what they should be working at. So the executives in this kind of board suffer from this syndrome where they do not give themselves a chance to improve or even a chance to the other non-executive directors to intervene or provide any kind of guidance. The only time they um, let the non-executives speak is when the company is in deep trouble. For example, Volkswagen. You might argue that it could be the executive directors who would know in and out about what they were doing the, to the engines of the cars and non-executive directors because they do not do the day-to-day -day, uh, dealings they might not know what was going on but that remains a mystery as per the company ordinance whether you are an executive director whether you are a non-executive director you have equal liability you cannot plead in the court that oh sorry i'm the non-executive director i visit the company only four times a year that does not work when, when we are talking of law. You are as responsible, as liable as the executive directors. The last type is when one shareholder controls the board. You might argue that, yes, as per corporate governance principle, uh, it is the responsibility of the board of directors to act in the best interest of the shareholders. But I want to remind you, the principle is the board must act in the interest of all the shareholders. Hence, in this case, if one shareholder is controlling the board, it definitely is going to lead you towards shareholders' disputes. And in this case, most of the times, this shareholder in the past had been a majority shareholder. Uh, where he or she was controlling all the activities of the board and later on he or she diluted his or her share. But the influence still remains because you have uh, been in the company like a parent and everyone respects you for that matter. But the problem comes in when you become um, over controlling and in the process you uh, resist the company to grow or stop taking the risks that the company should take, that the company is required to take. I also want to draw your attention to another important factor, which is the independent directors. When I talk of independent directors, you might go to the corporate governance code and you might read what is an independent director. In simple words, an independent director is someone who is not influenced. Uh, let me give you an example. You finish your assignments and uh, you are about to submit that and you want to know if the PowerPoint presentation that you have prepared for your assignment is good. What do you do? Do you ask your friend who always tells you that you are great? So in that way, your friend is not helping you by telling you that, sorry, maybe you should improve in this area. So, what do you do? You need a friend who would give you a constructive feedback of telling you, I think you should improve on this area. Maybe you should be more elaborative here. 
someone who is critical of your performance, right? Similarly, this is how independent non-executive directors work. They are on the board only to promote this kind of constructive discussion where they question the wrongful decisions or if the company is going overboard in terms of risk taking, they question if that is worth doing that. The other measures of independence is given in the law, given in the corporate governance code in UK, in Hong Kong, in India, in a lot of countries you would see more or less they are similar things. Sometimes they say that, okay, you beyond certain percentage, if you are holding shares of a company, you are no more independent because you are so interested in the company and its performance. Uh, there is another nine year rule, uh, which is followed in UK corporate governance code and also in Hong Kong and in India, where you feel that if a director has worked for more than nine years in a company consecutively, then that director is no more independent unless it is approved by the shareholders in the general meeting. If they feel that the director is still independent, then he can be appointed as an independent director. But what I am trying to bring out uh, to you is that the independence is not a checklist. It's not about the criteria given in the code that you follow that and you are independent. Independence comes from independence of minds. Is your independent director independent enough to give you a feedback that someone who can go against the chair or this CEO or the other shareholders telling you that this is not the right way of presenting um, matters in your annual general meetings or the annual report or this kind of um, um, agreement is going to cause a lot of risk or how we should communicate with the internal shareholders or so. Someone who is going to challenge you. So I hope you understand the concept of independence of mind is more important than just a checklist of being an independent director. Now let us discuss how to deal with these bad boys. The first is nomination denial. If you know uh, a bit about how companies work, you would know that at most of the annual general meetings, which is a uh, meeting of the shareholders uh, every year, you nominate the directors to become uh, the directors for a particular period of time. So you tell those bad boys, the disruptive directors, that if you do not behave yourself, we are not going to nominate you in the upcoming annual general meeting. The next point is succession planning. When you are seeing that there are loopholes in your team, you know what you need to do. You need to plan ahead that this time we need to start thinking of other directors who could possibly replace this disruptive director or directors. Board evaluation is a very important tool to evaluate how your board individually and as a team has been performing. And if the scores are bad, you know what to do. You need a strong and balanced chairperson. When I say strong, I mean strong, but I also included the word balanced. Not too strong, not too less strong. We need a balance of strength for a chairperson. The committee count. So in most of the board of directors, we have independent committees also, which vary uh, depending on the nature of business you are in. So most of the companies have audit committee, they have corporate governance committee, we have nomination committee. The directors who are sitting on the board, they are also sitting in those committees. So you need to see if those committees are actually producing or adding value to your work or if they are just a cost center, or if you feel that those committees are just where people are just nodding and agreeing with everything and not promoting a debatable, uh, proper, valuable discussion. Now let us discuss how are the good boards? What are the signs of good boards? If your board members are having a real 
real discussion in the board meeting, not a paper-like meeting. That is a sign of a good board. If your agendas are well planned, if your agendas are not too long or too short, that they lose the impact of the important um, items in the agendas. If your board papers and reports are received well in advance of meetings, as per Hong Kong Corporate Governance Code, you have to submit the board papers at least three days before the board meeting. The board members come to the meetings in time and are well prepared. Too hard to believe, right? All the directors participate in the board discussions. Again, too hard to believe that, right? Different points of view are encouraged and discussed. Like I said, most of the family businesses, it is generally the independent directors who try to keep their mouth shut so that they do not offend or annoy the family head. But that would not be a balanced board. The CEO is neither over-influencing nor under-influencing the right kind of strength. Your independent directors are really independent. Like I explained to you, the concept of independence of minds. If your board is diverse, your board is good. Probably I should do another lecture on how um, board diversity is important. And um, there have been various researches which prove that diversity in the board leads to profitability. Now let us discuss how to solve people problems. It's actually a question to you. Do you think it is the human or cultural ties and constructive communication? Or you think we should have simple policies and procedures in place for the people to follow? What do you think? Most of you would say the first one, right? But I want to tell you, it is both. Sometimes you cannot solve all the problems with just constructive communication. You need to have clear policies on how people behave in the boardrooms, what kind of attendance they should have, what kind of time commitment they should have. Now let us discuss the suggestions for improvement of these bad boards. Well, you need to have a strong board structure where you have proper number of non-executives and executives and independent directors and uh, the internal uh, people who are representative of your company. The board has to focus on the priorities rather than personal agendas or the politics or the grudges. People have to be emotionally engaged, intellectually engaged as well. You need to have strong succession planning policies in place, not just on paper, so that you know what kind of skill is missing in your boardroom and what you need immediately. You must have regular board evaluation. Most of the companies skip this part or they do it internally, but I strongly recommend that you have an external party to engage in the board evaluation procedure. Thank you everyone for your time and I hope you learned um, from this seminar. Um, even if you did not learn a lot about corporate governance code, I believe that you now know how big uh, companies work in terms of their board of directors. And let me remind you that the board room is a revolving board room uh, door, which means directors come and directors go. But that does not mean that fixing one problem solves all your problems. It simply means that once you solve a problem, you might face newer problems in future. So it is an ongoing process. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.